favor is a divine assigned advantage for success. I'm blessed so that I can walk in a favor and God can dream his dreams through me and we can do the impossible because we think like that. Why does God want us to know his favor? So that we are able to advance his kingdom against all odds. God wants to bring you to a place where you live doing beyond the word. It's one thing to do what God says. It's another thing to do more than God says. Even in your own life, this could be the start of something big. Come on, church. Y'all ready? Who's ready for some favor? Come on. Hey, put your hand over your heart. If you're new with us, just say, say this with us and follow along on the screens. I am who God says I am, a child of God, the righteousness of God. I am the apple of God's eye. I am God's workmanship, created for good works. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Today, I open up my mind to receive the word of God so I can think like God, be like God, and do life the way God intended for me to live. Let's lift up holy hands. Say it with me. Come, Holy Spirit. Help me elevate my thinking so I can elevate my life in Jesus' name. Amen? All right. Hey, go ahead and stay standing for a minute if you would. Um, you know, it, the year was 1998, and um, I was in the Compact Center in Houston, Texas, and I was at a big success event there, and Nolan Ryan came out on stage, and he threw me this ball, and it's actually signed by him, and you're going to hear a little bit of the story today, but when I caught this ball, uh, the Lord spoke to me very profoundly, and I don't play with this. If you've been around our church a long time, you know I don't say this. Well, you know, here's what the Lord spoke to me, but the Lord spoke to me and said, I've thrown you the ball of favor, and then in the next moment, he said, and I want you to throw it to other people. And so, anyway, being an athlete, I think that's the way God speaks to me a lot of times and always has used athletic metaphors. But the reality is, uh, a few weeks ago, I went to Houston, called Joel, and I said, Hey, Joel, I want to tell the story. But I don't just want to tell the story. I want us to both tell the story about what happened in the Compact Center two years. Um, actually, it, was, it ended up being about four or five years before they the Compact Center became Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. So today we have a very special treat. Joel Osteen and I are tag teaming today from Lakewood Church. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to do that right now. So go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope you enjoy the message today. And I'll be back in just a few minutes. But right now, again, we sat down a few weeks ago, me and Joel Osteen, and had a little talk about the favor of God. Here we go. Hey, Element Life Church, I'm so excited today to be with my dear friend, Joel Osteen, and thank you for being a part of this. We're launching our series called Catch the Favor, and uh, Joel, just so great to have you. Just greet everybody if you would. Thanks, Keith. Well, Bless hey, you. guys, we love you all there at Elevate Life. We love Pastor Keith and Sheila, and just uh, delighted to be with you today, talk a little bit about favor. I, I know, you know, I've been blessed to see God's favor on my own life, and I don't believe it's just for me or just for Keith. It's right. for all of us. And I even read uh, this morning, Keith, that the scripture says that the, the favor of God is for a lifetime. Mm. So it's not temporary. It's not, you know, there's favor in your future. There's favor right now. And God never runs out of favor. You know, he blessed Keith. He may have blessed somebody else, but he's got favor for you as well. He really does. You know, the Bible says that, that, that really when we magnify the Lord, that he, he brings his favor and he takes he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. I, I love that. But anyway, we're in this series, and Joel, I, I mean, I'm in this building, and for me, it's such a, a moment, uh, a historic moment in my own life. Uh, and here, and I'll, I'm just going to tell the story. What, what happened was this was the Compact Center. This is where the Houston Rockets, many times you, you uh, came here. You had, in fact, you had uh, season tickets right over here. Somewhere. Over there on the fourth row in section 104, I had season tickets there for years. <laughs> I yeah. love that. Yeah. Anyway, so in 98, uh, there was a success event here. And to kind of back up a week before, uh, there was um, an event in the Astrodome that I was a part of the week before the success event that happened here in 1998. And uh, anyway, the security team was taking me to the airport. And I said, well, hey, who all do you guys do security for? And they said, well, uh, you know, they started listing names. They said, and, you know, the largest success events uh, in the world. And 
They're, in fact, they're going to be in the Compact Center next week. And I said, oh, man, really? I said, I would love to, love to go to that. They said, we can get you VIP tickets, man. You'll be right up on the front row. And I said, that'd be awesome. So I, I called one of our friends, Jeff Hackleman. Yeah. And, uh, and you went to college with Jeff, right? I tried to room with him. Roomed with him. And anyway, I didn't know that. You know, we were just, Jeff and I were just friends. And so I said, hey, Jeff, I'm going to be coming your way. He's in uh, Huntsville. And I said, for a big success event, uh, that's going to be there. Nolan Ryan's going to be there, and former presidents are going to be there, different people, and I'd love to invite you as my guest to come. So he said, sure, that'd be awesome. So anyway, the next weekend, I found myself coming to Houston, came into the Compact Center. I'm sitting right there on the front row, and, uh, and so just having a great time. This place was packed out with people just wanting to grow, learn, and develop. And so the man who was leading the organization at that time came out on stage, and he said, Nolan Ryan is going to throw a baseball out into the crowd uh, to the most excited, enthusiastic person in the crowd. Well, you know, honestly, Joel, this is the truth. I don't, I don't really care about sports memorabilia. I mean, I've never been a collector or anything like that. But, but it was like he walks out, Nolan Ryan walks out, and he, he's, he's looking out over the crowd. And I don't know about you, Joel. Of course, you, you, know, you, you have this big space that you preach in all the time. A lot of times I'm not like just looking on the front row because I've got to look at the whole crowd. And so I'm thinking, I'm sitting on the front row and I said, just something on the side of me, I said, I need to get that ball. So anyway, I've, in my own personality, I start jumping up and down, throw me the ball, throw me the ball. Well, you know, he's looking all the, you know, whether 16, what did he see at that time? 16. 16,000 people. And uh, everybody's cheering, everybody's screaming. And so I jump up and I say, throw me the ball. Now I'm gonna suit the whole thing. <laughs> And so Nolan Ryan starts laughing, and he just goes, boom, throws me this ball. When I caught the ball, Joel, uh, immediately I started crying. It was the weirdest, just the weirdest thing. And so our friend, Jeff Hackelman, says, man, you really wanted that ball. I said, no, it's not that. I said, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God, when I caught this, just came, came on me, and he spoke to me that I'd caught the ball of favor. I thought in my mind, like, it just, back in 1998, didn't really have necessarily a revelation of favor or anything like that. And I just thought, okay. And so I'm standing there just for a few seconds. And then, I don't know if you know Tudor Bismarck. Yes. But Tudor Bismarck from Harare, Zimbabwe, Africa, is somebody that I know. And he happened to be at that event. And, I mean, it wasn't two or three minutes. He comes running up and he said, in this British accent, he says, the Spirit of the Lord just spoke to me that you've caught the ball of favor. So Jeff Hackleman looked at me like that. And in that moment, God spoke to me and he said, this place is going to be a church. Mm -hmm. This place, in fact, when the world looks at the church, this is going to be what it, looks, what it looks like to the world. And I tell Jeff right then, I said, Jeff, it's the craziest thing, man. I said, God just, I mean, I'm just the Spirit of the Lord's on me, you know, it's, and it's the weirdest thing because it's in, it's not in a church service, it's not, but I mean, the power of God was on me. And I said, God just spoke to me that this place is going to be a church. And when the world looks at this place, that's going to be their image of what the church is. He goes, wow, that's, that's just crazy, you know. So anyway, I didn't, honestly, I didn't think really anything else about it until I began to hear that you guys were looking at the Compact Center. And I don't know if it was through Jeff. I don't remember how you heard that I heard. Maybe you remember, maybe you don't. But about that story that you actually had me come here at Lakewood and share that story. Yeah. Do you remember how you heard? Or I think I heard it from Jeff. And yeah. then, of course, I'd known you. And then once, once I met you, you told me the story. Yeah. And I was, I was amazed because, you know, we never dreamed we would be here. But for you to see that... And that was before my dad died. Yeah, that was in '98. Yeah, and so it was. It was. It was so crazy because I remember um, at that time I did not know that Jeff had been your roommate. I mean, I didn't even really know there was any kind of connection. Of course, you weren't on the radar as it relates to being in ministry in terms of of you know visual ministry. You've been in the ministry your whole life, been a part of a ministry family, and running the the television ministry here. But so it wasn't like this conversation that, oh, I know Joel Osteen, and they're thinking about, no, there was no thought in 1998 that that was even going to happen. Yeah. And, uh, and so I share that to say this, that just like Joel started in the very beginning to say that 
You know, favor is for everybody. It, but, but we've got to, you know, we've got to catch the favor, Joel. We've got to, we've got to put ourselves in a position where we, it's almost like you can be driving down the road and every, every day, the Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will be glad in it. We can drive down the road. The sun is shining. Well, why is the sun shining for us? We can drive down the road and it'd be a beautiful day. And us not even cognizant of the fact, you know, we're going here, we're going there, that really God has made this day for us. And that's what favor's like. It's like, it's like God has made favor for us. He, we are his sons. We are his daughters. And, you know, Joel, I was looking at a, definition for favor. There's many definitions. There, and I think there's many levels, honestly, of favor. And I surely don't have it all figured out. I mean, grace is God's unmerited favor. So that's where favor starts. But when you look at scripture and you see in Luke 2, verse 52, where Jesus grew in wisdom, he grew in stature, and he grew in favor with God and man, it kind of gives us a clue that if the Son of God, if Jesus himself had to grow in favor, then we do too. That it's not just, it's, it, it is there, but it's, it's there for the catching. It's there for the taking, so to speak. And so anyway, Joe, obviously all these years later, I mean, here we are, 2017, and the favor of God is on this place. Indeed, this place became the Great Lakewood Church that God is using all across the, the world. And, and certainly it was prophetic in the sense that, and I'm not saying that to puff me up to, hey, I got the word, but I, I got the word. I mean, I got the word that day. Like, and, and when it started unfolding, I went, man, that is exactly what God spoke to me. And, and, and then God said, now I want you to throw whatever, whatever that favor is. You've caught it. Now throw it on other people. You know, we're blessed to be a blessing, Joel. That's right. Anything that, that, that's good that happens in our life as much as it is for us, God wants it to be in us so it can be through us. And that's why he wants favor working in our life. But anyway, one of the definitions beyond, you know, the grace of God, uh, which that's God giving us more than we deserve, is a divine assigned advantage for success. That when you have the favor of God on your life, you have a divine assigned advantage for success. And that's why we need to catch it. But Joel, you've been in a great family of favor your whole life. And now you've got a family of choice favor, not just here in Houston at Lakewood, but really all over the world where you're, you're throwing favor. I mean, you're from Norfolk, Virginia recently to Dallas, Texas, to every major stadium. I was with you in the, I guess the first, before even before the Yankees played at Yankee Stadium, the new stadium, you did an event there. I mean, how amazing is that to be able to enter a baseball stadium to throw the first pitch? And the first pitch at Yankee Stadium was not a baseball. It was the favor of God. I know. And I'll never forget that night. When, when Joel preached, it looked like to me, and I'm not exaggerating, that when he gave the invitation to come to Christ, it looked like that whole place st stood up. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, it's amazing. That had to be a great moment too for you even. Yeah, it, it is. It was, Keith, and it's amazing. I love what you're saying to catch the ball of favor yeah. because I believe we have to live favor-minded because, mm, you know, like good. Pastor Keith said that favor's all around, but if you go through life thinking, well, I never get any good breaks or, you know what, I don't come from a pastor family like you, Joel, or we can all come up with a million excuses, but God has favor for each one of mm. us. And Keith, you, you said it, we, we wouldn't be sitting here, well, you talked about catching the ball of favor. I can tell you, we wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for God's favor and if we didn't release that favor in our lives. Mm. I, I believe part of that favor is to believe that you can pray bold prayers mm. and believe to ask God for big things. And you know, when I, when I started off, Keith, I was, like you said, I was behind the scenes for 17 years and I was doing the television production for my father's ministry and for Lakewood here actually the, the northeast side of town. But, uh, you know, my dad died suddenly in 1999, and I felt like I was supposed to step up and pastor the church, but I'd never ministered before. Mm. I'd done 17 years of the lighting, the production, and all that, but I just knew that I knew that I was supposed to do it. But you know, what's interesting, Keith, is every voice told me, you can't minister. Nobody's going to listen to you. You haven't been to seminary, and you don't have the training and all this. I've learned, Keith, you can talk yourself into your dreams or you can talk yourself out of your dreams. You know, if I'd listen to all those voices, Joel, you can't do it, you're not anointed, your dad was a minister, not you. But you know what, I had to, 
I had to just dismiss all that, ignore those, and just say what God says about me. And you know, like, like you're saying, Keith, I, I always said, God, I think that I have your favor. I think that I'm surrounded by your goodness. I think that I'm well able to do what you've called me to do. And I stepped up to pastor the church, Keith, and I didn't know if it would, I didn't know what happened. We never dreamed it would grow. We thought if we could maintain what my parents had built there for 40 years, there were 6,000 people there, and we thought that would be hitting a home run. But God's dream for your life is so much bigger than your own. I mean, here we sit, Keith, 17 years later. We talked about it earlier. I had my season tickets right over there. I used to watch Akeem and Larry Bird play here for, you know, all through the 90s. And never in my wildest dreams would you tell me or would you convince me that one day I'd be a minister, one day we would own the compact center and have church here. But again, it's... God's plan for your life is bigger than your own. When you live favor-minded and you believe, have that enthusiasm like Keith, you know, throw me the ball of favor. God, I believe your, your hand of goodness and mercy is upon me. I've learned God will open doors that you couldn't open. He'll take you places that you couldn't go on your own. And, you know, people ask us, Keith, how did all this happen? I don't know how it happened. <laughs> you have to say, you know, I know I'm, I'm reaping seeds that my parents have sown yeah. all those years. They lived a life of integrity and helping others. And I came along and I got to reap those seeds. But all along the way, I, could have to, I, would, I would tell you, it was the favor of God opening doors and connecting us with the right people and just uh, making things happen that we couldn't make happen. Even one thing real quick, Keith, when I was, I was sitting on the front row one time and the man behind me, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Joel, I designed the freeway off ramps and the on ramps for this building 35 years ago. He was a, like an engineer for traffic. And he said, oh yeah, we made, the, we made the exit ramps perfect where they'd feed right into this building. We made them where you'd get right back on. And it made me think about how, you know, 35, 40 years ago, God was already planning what he had, you know, in yeah. store for us. And so that's what, you know, the goodness of God, the favor of God, when you dare believe, God will do amazing things in your life. Well, how did, how, let me ask you this. How did, how did the switch uh, flip for you. You know, you're behind the cameras. Your 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 father's passing. Um, how did how did it switch where you knew this is what I'm going to do? And then, at what point you're already at that place where you go, I don't know if I you know if I'm supposed to do that. I don't you know all those things. But then, how do you start thinking, compact center? I mean, it was it was interesting, Keith. When my father died, I had spoken. Uh, for him, I'd ministered for him for the first time five days before on a Sunday, and he died on that next Friday. So that was unusual that for 36 years I would never get up and minister, but I got up for him that one time, not even knowing that, of course, that he was going to pass away. My dad was in good health. He, he had a heart attack, but... Hey, so, let me stop you. Yeah. He, I, that's glorious to me, that the, that the last thing your dad really got to experience on earth, talk about favor was he saw you, he saw this, he yeah. saw it in you. And the last thing before he went to heaven was to, heaven on earth, was to get to see you step into that place. That's amazing. And it's Keith, amazing. And you think, Keith, he had asked me those 17 years, every year he'd asked me, come up and minister, <laughs> Joel, you'd be a good pastor. But I didn't have it in me. I, I don't think it was, you know, it wasn't God's plan for me right, right. then. But... You know, I did do it that, that one time that he called and asked me to minister. Something in me said, Joel, you need to do it. Mm. And so I took that step of faith. I spoke for him that Sunday, never dreaming that he would die the next Friday. Wow. And so, you know, Keith, my dad was, you know, one of my best friends. and We hung out together and traveled the world together. And I, I didn't know what I'd do when my dad was gone. But, you know, God had another plan. But let me tell you, when my dad passed away that Friday... Two or three days later, after I got past the shock of my dad dying, you know, I was kind of in a fog for a couple of days, but I felt that same desire to step up and pastor the church. And I don't really know how to explain it, except that I knew that I knew I was supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. And again, I didn't know if it'd be successful. I'd never ministered before, but I thought, God, I'm going to take this step of faith. And if it doesn't work out, I'll go back to running camera and doing <laughs> that other stuff because I was pretty good at that. But, you know, I think, Keith, it was just a step of faith mm -hmm. because, again, everything in my mind was telling me it couldn't happen. But there's times that you know that you know that you know you're supposed to do something and all your logical reasoning may say it's never going to work out. But that's what faith is all about. If you can do it on your own, you don't need God's favor. So, so there's times that you have to just say, God, I believe this is what you've called me to do. And, 
you know, like I did. God, if I miss it, it won't be the first time, but I believe you'll, you know, you'll help me make it right. But I took that step of faith, Keith, and just doors begin to open and, mm. you know, then all of a sudden just, I don't know, just had to, just, when, when I heard this place was coming available. So, so at what point, like, let me, let me just say this sure. while, I, while you're talking, here's what I'm thinking. You know, Joel's saying being favor-minded, but really to be favor-minded, you have to be faith-minded. And that's really what you did, right? You, yeah. you just stepped, he stepped out in faith and because he was faith-minded, all of a sudden he realized there's favor. And actually when you stepped out and took that, that step of faith, that's when you begin to catch the favor. I mean, wouldn't that be yeah. the case? That's exactly right. Because it was there, but when you stepped out, and, and again, the only thing you, when you're saying about, you know, for 17 years he wanted you to do that. And I've always said this, that the only thing more important than any decision you ever make is the timing of the decision. Yeah. And honestly, just as your friend, and I'm going to say this to you guys, Joel is a master of timing. I don't know. I don't know. How, I don't know how that works. That's one of the favorite things that's on his life. But how important is that? I mean, yeah. it could have been earlier and it not been, yeah. but it was like you know, and hey, I've just got to know the right time. And it wasn't because his dad was dying, right? That's right. It was. It was like. Your dad asked you to do it. Nobody knew your dad was going to die in five days. But your dad, and, and you allowed really the spirit of the Lord to lead you. You took the step of faith and bam, all of a sudden in taking that step of faith, you're catching favor and God starts doing amazing things. I know. And so, it's amazing. Speaking about timing real quick, you know, because that is difficult sometimes because, you know, you got you to do your best to stay in God's timing. But right. Keith, those, those last couple of years that my father was alive, you know, as I mentioned, I was doing the production and I'd, I'd do big live events at the church, many concerts. And so I love doing that because yeah. I loved putting on all this production type stuff. Last couple of years, my dad didn't want to do any of that. He said, Joel, I'm 75 years old. I want to relax. I don't want to, I don't want any more work because some of it involved him. He said, <laughs> I don't want any more work. And Keith, you know, I kind of felt like, well, maybe this is my time to go do something else. Mm. Cause I had opportunities to work with big ministries and you know, I just, I, I was a little bit frustrated in a sense, but I came back home and I told Victoria, but I, I felt like God said to me, Joel, this is your dad's vision. Honor him, stay faithful, do what he's asking you to do. And I made that decision mm. those last couple years just to honor my father, talking about timing. Mm. Well, I look back now, Keith, and I realize God put those dreams in my heart for my own life. It just wasn't the right time. Two or three years later, so I could do all that stuff that I wanted to do. And I really believe had I not been faithful right then, and like Keith said, just, you know, trust God's timing. And, you know, you know it sounds maybe confusing when we're saying step out, but I, th I do think you have to feel it in your yeah. heart. You have to know. You don't have to beat doors open. You do your best and you let God open the doors, but it doesn't mean you don't believe for big things. I'm always believing for things. God opened these doors. You know, you go years and maybe it, it hasn't, you know, certain things haven't happened, but you're passing the test, being faithful right where you are. So good. So, so you, you, you step in, what was 2000? Was it, or 99? Yes, 99, my father died. Okay, so 99, what, at what point? It's January. It? January of 99. So, so at what point did you start thinking Compact Center? It was about three years, Keith, that the church started to grow. Yeah. It amazed us, but the church started to grow. And about three years in, we knew we needed a bigger facility. You couldn't, buy, you couldn't build a bigger place where we were because the roads couldn't handle mm. it. We were in more of a neighborhood before. And we looked for property out 20 minutes away in that part of town where the church was. And um, twice, property we found, it didn't work out. It's just like the doors kept closing. You know, you're disappointed. You yeah. think that's the devil taking our property. <laughs> but Keith, it was, it was about 2002 or 2003 that after all those disappointments of property closing, a friend called me out of the blue. He said, can I take you to lunch? An older gentleman, we, I can tell you right where we were sitting at the table, he said, the Rockets are going to move out of the compact center. You ought to try to buy that facility. It's owned by the city. And the first thing I said was, that building will be $500 million. Yeah. It's on the main freeway. It's in the best part of town. I, he said, no, the city only owes $7.5 million. And it's a longer story, but my parents knew the mayor. He was the first African-American mayor, and they were good to the mayor. They, they supported him, not politically, just as friends. And, yeah. and so I went back home. I went back to the office, and I picked up the phone, and I called the mayor. It's Mayor Brown. I saw him just two days ago. I said, Mayor Brown, you know what? I hear the rockets are moving out. The city owns the compact center. 
What about Lakewood taking it? He said, Joel, I think Lakewood having the compact center would be fantastic for our city. Mm. And I'd had to be put out for bid and all that, but man, you had the mayor on you. And boy, when I heard that, something came alive on the inside. Wow. And it just, things begin to fall into place. It was a three year battle, yeah. but things fell into place. But you know, it even goes back to the seeds my parents sowed, yeah. being good to the first African American mayor, mm. never dreaming that one day their son would be calling asking for the compact center. Because all he would have had to say is, I don't think that's a good idea. Exactly. And you probably don't need to do that, and you wouldn't have thought another thing about it. No, because he controlled it. Yeah. You know, he controlled it. He because it is not the right time for the wow. city, and so it was just it was the hand of God all along the way. Not saying that there weren't obstacles, because yeah. when we when we won the vote, a company filed a lawsuit, and that was a two and a half year battle. Yeah, talk about that because I remember part of the story that I want you to tell them about. Uh, you didn't have the votes that yeah. you needed. Yeah. Well, you're talking about favor. So two years, so this was owned by the city. So we had to convince the city council members they had to vote for us to have it. So we needed 10 votes. There were 15 city council members, 10 to pass. We worked for two years and mm. I've never been in politics, but it's hard to get people <laughs> to vote for you because there's so much, so much political opposition. And we had t what, 10 years, we had 10 votes. It was two days before the final vote. They'd sign off on it. Well, one of our votes, one of our people that were voting for us, our city council members, he got so much pressure, he called and said, sorry, I'm gonna be out of town. Well, he was saying, <laughs> I'm not gonna vote for you. But you know, him not being there was a no vote. Well, he got so much pressure. This is a large financial industry, a city, a neighborhood that we're in right now. He got so much pressure from the financial. They didn't want a crazy church down yeah. there like us. But, so he said he wasn't gonna vote. And so, man, two years, we thought, God, you know, this, the paper came out, said Lakewood's not going to get it, it's too late. Well, there was a young Jewish council member that had been against us the whole two years. I went to see him the night before the main vote. I said, Council Member Goldberg, I said, you know what, you could make this, you know, all happen. I don't know why you're not for us and all this stuff. And I tried to convince him, he's a nice man. He said, you know what, Joel? He said, I'm gonna vote for you tomorrow, but not because of anything you've done, but last night, this older Jewish lady that I grew up with, I haven't spoken to her in over 20 years, she called me and said in no uncertain terms, I was supposed to vote for Lakewood. He said, I have so much respect for her. When I heard that coming from her, I changed my mind. You know, it was a crazy thing, Keith. I don't know who that lady was. Wow. I've never met her, but God has the right people already lined up for you. Again, God can make things happen that you could have never made happen. I worked two years trying to convince him. My convincing wasn't very good. But you know, out of the blue, this one lady called her, and today we have the compact center. He comes and sits on the front row every six months. That's and amazing. The people still stand up and give him, give him a standing ovation. And I thought, all the heartache he put me through. <laughs> no, but he's, he was the one guy. He was the one, one vote that you needed. And you know, that's really the way favor is, is that when you catch the favor, again, faith-minded, favor-minded, and then all of a sudden what begins to happen is that God begins to arrange things in the unseen, the providence of God in the unseen that we could never orchestrate. Like you went over there, I mean, even to talk to the guy, and he said, I'm not gonna do it because you talked to me, but hey, by the way, here's what happened last night. And I just, I, I find that so favor fascinating. I mean, that's all I can no, say. It's amazing. It reminds me, Keith, that God has the right people lined up mm. for you. He has the right buildings. I believe when that engineer told me on the front row that he designed the entry and exit ramps, that God knew that Lakewood was going to be here. And so he's got everything arranged for your life. The scripture says that God knows the end from the beginning, that he's written every day of our life in his book. And Yes, we go through some chapters that are difficult, but you know what? You keep moving forward and there's chapters of favor. There's chapters of the right people being there. There's chapters of compact centers, so to speak. So you live favor-minded. You know that, you know, when you know God's longing to be good to you, that he's your heavenly father, when you walk in obedience, that he loves to do good things, just like you like to do good things for your children. Well, God is the same thing. He wants us to succeed so we can be a blessing, mm. like Pastor Keith said, and so we can advance the kingdom. He wants to make you an example of his goodness. And you know, Keith, every time cars drive by now on the freeway, this is the second busiest freeway in the nation this building's located on, every, every one of them 
Well, maybe not every one of them, yeah. but many of them think there's, there's Lakewood. That's yeah. the goodness of God. That's that place of hope. Well, it's an example to our city. Mm. And uh, I believe that's what God wants to do for all of us, make us an example of his goodness. It's so good. And, you know, I just want to say to everybody, and then, I'm, Joe, I'm going to just have you uh, give a final word and pray over everybody. But I just, you know, I think for some of us, we think, oh, God did that for Joel. God will do that for somebody, but could God ever do that for me? And what would you say to that? I mean, somebody that's sitting out there going, well, yeah, but I just don't know how anything would ever happen for me. And while you're thinking about the answer, here's what I want to say to you, that if Jesus grew in favor with God and favor with man, and there needed to be a time for that to happen, then the same pattern has to happen in our lives. And we just have to be faith-minded. We have to be favor-minded. We have to be faithful in the journey. And then God does things that are exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. And God is always going to do more than we could ever ask. But the reason we need favor is because of the great promises that God has for you in your future. In other words, why would Jesus need to grow in favor with God and man? Because of the great things that God wanted to do through Jesus in the earth so that when Jesus in John 17 verse 22 said, Father, you've given me your glory, now I give it to them, that that same assignment comes on us, Joel, just like it came on you. And now look what the Lord has done. But just... Whatever's in your heart, and if you don't mind, just pray for everybody. Yeah, well, it's awesome to be with you today and have Pastor Keith here. I guess my encouragement would be don't limit God. Mm. I mean, I think so many times we, we put limitations on ourselves. We put limitations on God, just like Keith was saying, well, Joel, that's not going to happen for me because I don't have the education or I've made mistakes or my dreams are too big. I don't know the right people, but that's going to limit what God can do in your life. We wouldn't be sitting here today if we'd had that kind of attitude. You've got to believe that God can do great things, that He can open doors you can't open, that He can take you places that, that you can't take yourself. So I just in, in, encourage you to stretch your faith, live faith-minded, live favor-minded, know that God's longing to be good to you. And I believe God is going to make you an example of His goodness, of so His good. favor, and just uh, take you where you've never dreamed. But I would love to pray over you if I could. So, Lord, I just pray for thank all the Jesus. people that are watching, those that elevate life. And Lord, I just thank you today. Faith is stirring in their hearts. Yes. Vision is, is springing up on the inside. Lord, like you said, I thank you that they are surrounded by your favor right now. Not one day, but even now, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that you would show them a sign of your favor, like you've done for us and Pastor Keith and others. Lord, I just thank you for opening those doors that no man can shut giving them the wisdom to make the right decisions. And Lord, I just thank you that you will continue to bless them, prosper them, take them where they could not go on their own. I thank you that you've already lined up the right people, the right opportunities, the right breaks. And Lord, that they'll walk into your goodness, your mercy, that they will grow in that favor and just see your goodness in amazing ways. We declare it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. Well, you know, Joel, what we receive, it's ours free, freely to freely give. And whatever you've received, God says, I want you to give that. So I'm going to put a demand on you. So take me by the hand. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray a double portion of that favor on me. Would you do that? Just speak that right in front yeah. of our church. And you got I, it. You right. got it, Lord. I just pray what <laughs> Keith you, said, that you will increase him in favor you, and Jesus. influence and opening doors. Thank and Lord, you, just Lord. should... Use Keith and Sheila just in incredible ways. Thank we just you, speak Jesus. your blessings and your favor upon his life that mm. you'll reward his obedience and all the seeds that he's sown, Lord, that he'll reap a great harvest on those. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I just wanted to take that moment in front of y'all, God, and everybody because <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to be with somebody like you and not like... Uh, Elijah did Elijah say, hey, I want a double portion of what you got. So anyway, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Joel, for taking time to do this. Thanks for being our friend. Um, I can't tell you how many people come to our church. Many of them are watching right now and say, well, you know what? I, I, I saw Joel invited me to come here, so I came. Joel invited me to come. So anyway, it's amazing. We love you guys. God bless you.